One of the nicest things about winning the Nobel Prize is hearing from all of the people in your past and having the time to reflect on the important role they've each played in getting me to this very happy and fulfilling life I have now. So to all of my friends from, from grade school up to my peers who nominated me for this honor, you have my deepest thanks. So, um, let's see. Uh, so I got started in super resolution back in 1982 when I went to Cornell University for graduate school and met my eventual thesis advisors, Mike Isaacson and Aaron Lewis. So um, Mike had recently developed a means of using electron beams to fabricate holes in a membrane as small as 30 nanometers and then make the, the membrane opaque. And he and Aaron figured that if we could shine light on one side of the screen, then the light that initially comes out the hole from the other side would create a sub-wavelength light source that you could then scan point by point over the sample and generate a super resolution image. And so the idea was to try to create an optical microscope that could look at living cells with the resolution of an electron microscope. Compared to that, everything else in the department seemed boring to me, so I said, please sign me up, because that sounded really exciting. So at that time, many people told us that this idea would never work, either because it violated Abbe's law, or even worse, the uncertainty principle. But all doubt was removed from my mind in 84 when we learned about the work of Eric Ash and Nichols, um, who in 1972 used three centimeter microwaves and was able to, by near field techniques, get 1 60th of the wavelength of resolution of light in test patterns in a beautiful paper in Nature. And in fact, the idea for near field goes back even farther, originally to E.H. Singe back in 1928, and many, many people have independently come up with the idea since. For far field super resolution, the earliest demonstration I'm aware of is by Lucos. So back in 1967, by inserting grating masks at planes conjugate to the sample in the object, he was able to beat Abbe's limit by about a factor of three. But this is at very low numerical aperture, but still a demonstration that Abbe's law was not inviolate. And in fact, um, far field super resolution has a very long history, particularly in the semiconductor business, where the nonlinear interaction of the light with photoresist has been a staple of making line widths far smaller than the wavelength of light for a generation. Even more impressive, though, is how visible light is used to inspect semiconductor wafers. And by having a priori knowledge of the pattern you actually expect to create and doing theory about the diffraction of light from those patterns and comparing the actual data you get against that theory, people in today are able to measure and see the line widths of these features to about a thousandth of the wavelength of light. So really, at some level, super resolution is not new at all. And there's people in Silicon Valley who are probably laughing at us here today, thinking that we're the guys who invented this, when this has been a staple for a very long time. Um, but in my mind, really, the guy who deserves the lion's share of the credit for, for not just pushing a little bit beyond Abbe's law of lambda over 2n, which is still 2n sine theta, which is still related to numerical aperture, but actually breaking through the more theoretically su supposedly insurmountable limit of lambda over 2 is, is Eric Ash, because he was the guy who really shattered it by getting to lambda over 60 with the near field technique. Speaking of shattering, the probes, of the, the types of apertures we were making in those, in those thin membranes would break all the time. They were hard to make. They were costly. So eventually we abandoned that and we instead pulled glass micropipettes, similar to the method that was developed just a few years before in patch clamping for single ion channel recording. We would then coat these with aluminum to create an opaque structure, except for the little hole at the end that there would then be our aperture. So with that, I built my, this monstrosity you see here, which was my first near-field optical microscope. Um, I cringe now at how complex and crazy this thing was, but at least it gave me the, the, the ability to learn the system engineering skills I would need to become a true engineering physicist. And eventually, I was able to surpass the diffraction limit 
with this near field microscope that I did in my thesis. So that microscope was frankly a pain in the ass to work with and the resolution gain was at best about a factor of two beyond Abbe's limit. But it was good enough to get me my dream job at Bell Labs um, and so I started trying to develop that technique further for a few years and it was a very hard slog but thanks to the the patience and encouragement of my boss, Horst Stormer, I eventually came to realize that that probe was not a really good design because the light that was sent down that taper was largely retroreflected back before it ever got to the tip, and the little bit of light that did make it to the tip were in electromagnetic modes that didn't couple well to the aperture. So postdoc Jay Troutman and I then instead created a probe that consisted of an adiabatically tapered optical fiber which would guide the light very efficiently to the tip region and then efficiently couple that light to the effinescent modes in the aperture. This made a probe that was 10,000 times brighter than the earlier probes and also then allowed us to routinely get to about 50 nanometer resolution. Part of that was I also in the same year invented a means to dither the probe back and forth, oscillate it, and then as it would can't come close to the surface, that oscillation would be damped, and by that I could regulate the distance of the tip from the sample. So with these two innovations, near field became fairly routine. In 1992, we had the world record for data storage density when we could read and write bits in magneto-optic materials as small as 60 nanometers. We also demonstrated super resolution photolithography, nanoscale spectroscopy, and um, applied refractive index absorption and polarization contrast. In fact, to this day, near field remains the only diffraction unlimited technique which can use the full panoply of optical contrast mechanisms and isn't dependent on, say, a switching mechanism in fluorescence. But the mechanism that's probably most important for biology is fluorescence because it offers protein-specific contrast. In 93, we were the first to demonstrate super-resolution fluorescence imaging of cells when we looked at the actin cytoskeleton in fibroblast cells. What was impressive about this, though, is that what we could tell from the signal noise that we had on these single actin filaments and the size of our aperture was that it should be possible to see single fluorescent molecules. This was a very hot topic at the time because just a few years previously, W.E. and, and Michelle Orit had, had broken to this ultimate level of sensitivity of single molecule detection at cryogenic temperatures, and several groups such as Dick Keller at Los Alamos and then Rudolf Riegler had already shown at room temperature and solution that you could see bursts of fluorescence from single molecules. Key to these la later experiments was the idea that you had to restrict the excitation volume to reduce the background. Well, that's what near field excels at, is keeping a small excitation volume. So as soon as Rob Chichester and I decided to try to look at single molecules, on our very first try, we got really great results. And this is some of this. But the weird thing was, instead of seeing a bunch of just blobs or round spots, they would instead look like these crazy arcs or ellipses or other things, and these would change as we changed the polarization of the light. So I still remember running excitedly to, to horse office and trying to understand this, and together with his help, realizing that what we were seeing was the interaction of the electric dipole moment with the effinescent fields inside of the near field aperture. And that was what was giving rise to these patterns. And so what that means is that we could actually turn the experiment around and think of the molecule as the light source and the aperture as the sample. And by choosing molecules that were oriented along the X, Y, and Z axes, actually map out the nanoscopic electric fields inside of that aperture. We then compared this to a theory that Hans Bethe had developed back in 1944 and was able to show very good agreement. So once we had that, then we could use Beta's model to predict what kind of pattern we would see for any orientation of molecule, compare that to our data, and hence find the dipole orientation of every molecule in the field of view. And given that information, we were then able to fit these crazy shapes to the theory and find the positions of these molecules down to about 12 nanometers in X and Y and about 6 nanometers in Z. So this became very influential for what was to happen later.
So in another pivotal experiment, I joined forces with my best friend and colleague at, at, at um, Bell, Harold Hess. So Harold had made a name for himself at Bell a few years earlier by building a world-class scanning tunneling microscope with which, among other things, he discovered the core states at the centers of these vortices in the Abrikosov flux lattice of type II superconductors. Harold's and my interest was to combine uh, my near-field probe with his low-temperature scope to be able to study excitons, which are the sources of light generation in semiconductor uh, heterostructures, such as in this laser pointer and such as that uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2000. Um, so the goal was then to combine the high spatial resolution with my near-field probes with the high spectral resolution we could get in Harold's rig by running near absolute zero. So when we did this, we were surprised to find that the normally smooth spectrum that you see um, instead would break up into these crazy sharp lines. And furthermore, as we drove the probe, even small distances from point to point, the spectrum would change completely. And what we eventually realized is that we were seeing that the excitons could not be emit anywhere, but there were only certain specific points of exciton recombination, and the colors or, the, or where these points were was based on the local thickness of the quantum well at that particular spot. And so what was probably more important later on was that even though there might be a dozen or more of these emitting sites underneath even the small size of the near-field probe, we could still study them individually because they glowed in different wavelengths. So if we built up this higher dimensional space of x, y, and lambda, then we could look at them. So this is now then coming up to about 1994. And at that time, the limitations of the near-field technique became incredibly obvious. The, the foremost of these is that the near-field is ridiculously short. And so um, some of these problems are just engineering challenges, but some were truly fundamental. And so um, it was clear because of that short depth of focus, there was no way I was gonna realize my ultimate dream of looking at live cells with the resolution of an electron microscope. So, um, so I got very frustrated. At the same time though, near field got to be a big fad and like all scientific fads, you have a lot of people jumping in the field, they do sloppy results, they push all the problems underneath the rug and, um, and they overhype its capabilities. And so all of that made me very uncomfortable. And the third thing that tipped the balance for me was, was um, Bell, you had to work really hard to succeed at Bell. But what was happening by 94 is you could sense the changes that were happening in the company and that they would no longer value basic science in the way they used to. So it took these two young and innocent guys like this in 89 and turned us into these sort of stressed and worn out guys you see there just five years later. So, so all of that combined, all three of those things, and I said, screw it, I'm sick of science, I really hate academia, I quit. And so I just quit. And so I really had no idea what I was going to do next, but um, after a few months of trying to flush near-field microscopy out of my head, I was, I was uh, walking my daughter around in a stroller, and it hit me, I don't know how or where from, that you could combine that single molecule experiment I did with the spectroscopy experiment Harold and I did to come up with a different far field way of doing super resolution imaging. So the idea is if you have a bunch of molecules that are so close together that diffraction limit spots overlap, we've already heard about this, if you can find some way in which they differ from one another, and it can be anything, then you can isolate them in a higher dimensional space. But once they're isolated, you can find the centers of each one of those diffraction limited spots to much better than the width of the spot, and hence you plot all the coordinates of the molecules. So I published that idea in 95. In 99, Van Oijen and colleagues first demonstrated this by spectral isolation uh, at low temperature and found seven molecules in one diffraction limited spot, find them in 3D. And then in, in, uh, in the 2000s, several groups extended this to room temperature. Um, but again, by different means, photobleaching, lifetime, and blinking. And this was really a general concept I was trying to get across here. Um, the problem with all of these methods, though, is 
based on something called the Nyquist criterion. That if you want to make any microscope image you, of a certain resolution, you have to sample the resolution element divided by two. If I only go once every half period of this pattern, I can miss it completely. And so what that means is you have to have the ability by this method to see one molecule in two dimensions if I want to get 20 nanometer resolution on top of 500 that would be glowing at the same time. And none of the methods I just described were at the point of having that much isolation in that third dimension to get very much beyond the diffraction limit. I didn't have a really good idea in 95 other than running at cryogenic temperatures with a near field microscope. That was going to be a hero experiment and I was sick of science so I, I just published the idea and left it at that. Eventually I ended up working for my dad's machine tool company in Michigan where I did a number of things but this was my best baby, the one I'm proudest of. This was a, a servo hydraulic machine tool that would use an old hyd hydraulic technology, marry it to sort of energy storage principles that you have in hybrid cars today. It would move four tons at eight Gs of acceleration and position it to five microns, collapse the size of machine tool from the size of the stage to something, you know, much smaller, um, and be much cheaper, much faster, much better. I spent four years developing that idea, three years trying to sell it, and in the end I sold two. So, so what I learned is, is that I may be a bad scientist, but man, am I a worse businessman. So, so, so by 2002, I said, Dad, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of wasting your money. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, this just isn't going to work. And so, and so I quit and had no plan B as usual. And so this was then the darkest time in my life, right? Because not only had I pissed away my academic career, I had also blown up my backup plan of following in my dad's footsteps. I'm 42 years old with two young kids and no job and no prospect of a job. So, um, but I did something smart is that Harold had also gone into industry where he was considerably more successful than I was working for a startup in San Diego. So I reconnected with him and we just started getting together in different parts of the country, the national parks, and just, you know, talking what's the meaning of life you know, what, what is in, how can we have an impact before we die, da da da, you know, what's, what's interesting. What we realized is that while neither one of us fits well in the normal academic scheme of things, we both really love science and we love the ability to be able to pursue our curiosity. So we started trying to think about what we could do to have an impact in science again. But as you can see from these pictures, is that, as always, Harold is always three steps ahead of me. So, um, but, um, so that caused me to start reading the scientific literature, which I hadn't done for 10 years. And the first thing I ran across was green fluorescent protein. And it was a revelation to me, a shock, because it was such a big problem in the near field days, the labeling of cells to get it to work at high enough density and specificity. And the notion that you could coax a cell with a little bit of jellyfish DNA to be able to get it to produce any protein you want with a fluorescent tag on it. Just my jaw was hanging down for a week in astonishment at this. And so I, when I was casting around for an idea, I didn't want to do microscopy, but as soon as I saw this, I said, oh shit, I got to do microscopy again. So I said, okay, microscopy it is. And so Harold and I continued to look around. Um, but while I was taking my holiday from science, science wasn't standing still. So right after GFP, a lot of people want to understand the photophysics of that protein, in part to be able to do mutagenesis to get different colors so they could do multicolor imaging. So Stephen Boxer in 96 noticed that there isn't just one absorption hump for GFP, but two. And what was even crazier is that if you would study at this near UV, peak for a while, it would go down, but the peak at 488 would go up, that there was some kind of weird photoactivation effect in GFP happening. Then Tobias Meyer's group actually exploited this for what was the first sort of photoactivated pulse chase experiment, where they used wild type GFP and used UV light to then turn on GFP in a, in a certain part of the cell to then watch how those proteins go to other parts of the cell.
The following year, WE was able to show the same phenomenon with, with Rob Dixon in GFP at the single molecule level. So then George Patterson in about 2000, he was in Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz's group at NIH, was very interested in following what, what, um, what, uh, what Tobias had done. The problem was is that the on-off contrast ratio for wild type GFP was very low. So he did directed mutagenesis and eventually came up with what was called PAGFP, where you could turn on the fluorescence of molecules with a much higher contrast ratio and use these in much better pulse chase experiments. So in 2005, Harold recommended that we go visit the National High Magnetic Field Lab that was headed by our buddy from Bell, Greg Bobinger, so that we could meet this guy, Mike Davidson. Mike was a microscopist who had made a fortune selling neckties that were emblazoned with photomicrographs of cocktail mixes. And he channeled that money into creating the website tutorials for the major microscope companies, made a lot of money from that, and then used that to follow his passion of doing live cell imaging. And he eventually developed a library of 3,500 different fluorescent protein fusions. When we visited Mike, we first, Harold and I first learned about photoactivated GFP and the other photoactivated proteins that had come along. And so I vividly remember Harold and I sitting in the airport at Tallahassee, and then both of us being thunderstruck when we realized that this idea of being able to turn on molecules at one at a time was the missing link to make that idea I had pitched 10 years earlier to work. And so I had been pursuing another microscope idea at the time. We dropped that like a hot potato, and we said, this is easy. Let's do this and do it now. The problem is, is that Harold had quit his job a few months before, so now you have two guys who are unemployed, and how the hell are we going to do this? It's going to take too long to get a grant, too long to get VC funding. So because Harold doesn't burn his bridges as effectively as I do, he was able to take a lot of his equipment from Bell. And so we pulled that out of the storage shed, put 25K each of our own money into it. And normally you would do it in the garage like Jobs and Wozniak, but we were able to put it together in Harold's living room because he wasn't married. So uh, there was nobody <laughs> in the way to prevent that from happening. But, but we knew we had to work fast because this idea was going to be ripe and in the air. So we worked around the clock day and night in order to do this, or at least Harold worked day and night. I found the couch sometimes too comfortable, and so uh, Harold would tease me and keep taking pictures of me while I was asleep. But, um, but we were missing one thing, is you had two physicists who were totally naive about biology. And so we needed a good partner in that regard. So when I was pitching this other microscope idea, I called a buddy, Rob Tico, who had also been at Bell and was now at NIH. And so I was going to pitch that microscope, and that's the talk I gave. But I said, when I'm there, would I please, please, please be able to meet George Patterson and Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz? And so I took George and Jennifer to lunch, and I swore them to secrecy and told them the idea that Harold and I were working on. Many people would have blown us off because we, we were two crazy guys who hadn't published a paper in 10 years. Jennifer doesn't think that way, and I owe a lot of my success to her as well as Harold. She said, sure, bring it here. So we packed up the instrument from Harold's living room and work actually moved down in scale to actually working in this dark room in Jennifer's place, which is a lot less comfortable than the living room. Um, but then uh, started doing experiments. And very quickly, as when we brought it in, and then George did all the cell culture and transfections and, and, and the molecular biology to try out a whole different number of protein fusions. And we got to the point where you could turn out down the violet light so low that a few molecules at a time would come on. <clears throat> and then if you sum up those spots, you have the diffraction-limited image, but instead, if you find the centers, you start building the palm image. And after 20,000 frames, you go from the diffraction-limited image to the super-resolution image, or to appreciate better. So with high enough labeling density, you can get down to 20 nanometer resolution in your living room by this technique. So it's a fairly simple method. Um, <clears throat> 
So in a way though, Harold and I got lucky because we got lucky that there were certain photoactivated proteins and caged dyes that had enormous on-off contrast ratios. There's a lot of work in this field where I still don't feel like the field has really appreciated how important that on-off contrast ratio is to get from smushy looking results like that to much crisper results because of the background problems that you face. Um, so again, 2005 was the luckiest year of my life, not only for doing Palm. In Palm, we went from the idea to having the data for our science paper that got me on this stage today in six months. And that's what we could do because we were working alone in the living room, which is a very effective environment. So, um, but in the same year, by a different crazy set of circumstances, I got introduced to this guy, Jerry Rubin, Gen uh, HHMI was starting to want to build a freestanding research institution modeled on Bell Labs. And so the rebirth of Bell Labs caught Harold's in my interest. This guy's far-sighted enough to hire two guys who hadn't published a paper in 10 years. This was before the Palm paper came out. And so we went from rags to riches. Once this institution opened, we went and uh, ended up building next generation scopes. I hired a ha talented guy, Hari. Harold hired Gleb, and then we did this type of work. So in my group, we focused on applications for the first few years. Here with Jan Lippart's group at Berkeley, we looked at chemotaxis receptors in E. coli, and we were able to show that um, these various cluster sizes you see in their positions along the poles are completely predictable in terms of a stochastic model of self-assembly where the proteins are randomly inserted in the membrane and then diffuse until they stick to an existing cluster. We also showed that many proteins, such as in these focal adhesions that attach the cell to the substrate, which look co-localized at the diffraction limit, are nothing like co-localized at higher resolution. With Bob Tejan's group at Genelia, we're able to show a mechanism of gene silencing where the core promoters are spatially segregated from genes that hug up against the nuclear membrane. And with Tom Blanpede's group at Maryland, we were able to look at live um, cultured neurons and show that the actin that gives shapes to the dendritic spines is only polymerized in certain discrete locations. At the same time, Harold being the better physicist than I am, built the ultimate palm microscope that used a three-phase interferometer concept. He originally developed in industry to measure the fly height of recording heads over recording discs, but with that has even better sensitivity in Z than in XY. Worked with Claire Waterman to unravel the entire architecture of focal adhesion proteins vertically from the substrate up to the actin. Uh, cytoskeleton. In a recent paper with Jennifer's group, they were able to resolve an unknown question about escort proteins which are involved in HIV budding as to whether these act outside of the bud or inside of the bud, and they showed that the latter is true. Harold has also worked, because he has a lot of background from industry in electron microscopy, at correlating electron microscopy with palm both in three dimensions, in this case looking at mitochondrial DNA and its location inside of the mitochondria, in this case looking at clathrin coated pits. So, um, so I think a lot of my success is attributable to the fact that I'm a pessimist and I like to focus on problems because I think problems are opportunities. So I'd like to say a bit about what are the problems with super resolution microscopy instead of extolling its virtues. First is that, as I said earlier, based on the Nyquist criterion, you need insanely high density of labels. These can cause overexpression of proteins to get to those levels, or if you use exogenous dyes, it's hard enough to get enough specificity without a bunch of background. 95% of what we look at in super resolution is fixed cells, but it's known that, fix, that chemical fixatives alter the ultrastructure at the nanoscale. And so we have to put an asterisk next to almost everything that we learn by chemical fixation. What I think was a very important innovation a couple years ago was um, to get around the labeling density problem was Jan Ellenberg's group studied the nuclear pore and then um, even though it was difficult to get 
perfect labeling of every structure. If you look at thousands of these stereotypical structures, you can do particle averaging techniques bar borrowed from cryo-electron microscopy, and then you're able to determine the positions of every one of these different proteins in the nuclear pore to less than one nanometer by super-resolution optics. And there was an ambiguity in the cryo-EM data as to which way the subunit was oriented inside of that, and that was addressed by super-resolution microscopy in this way, a really great example. So, of course, we heard in the introduction that Sven gave that the real promise of super-resolution, though, is the ability or the, and the hope to look at living cells. But it's still largely a promise. Even though there's been technical demonstrations, it's been very little in terms of, I'd say, real biology learned. And the problem is, is that, um, is that if you, if you want to get to higher and higher resolution, you A, have to collect many more photons than you've ever had to do with the diffraction limit. The methods that are used today require power densities. Life evolved at a tenth of a watt per square centimeter. We go anywhere from a gigawatt per square centimeter to a kilowatt per square centimeter with super resolution techniques. So you have to ask yourself, what are you doing to the poor cell when you're trying to look at it live? Um, and then finally, the acquisition times of many of these methods are way slower than the rate at which dynamics is happening in the cell, so you get motion-induced artifacts or can't follow the thing you want to do. The one technique which, which can do much better is because it offers much lower resolution is SIM, which gets only twice beyond the diffraction limit, but it really offers a lot of other benefits. And, you know, it's a shame that you couldn't have four people in a Nobel Prize because I think this technique is totally justified to be a part of this. So, um, the, one of the real pioneers of this technology was Swedish native Mats Gufdesen, who eventually became my colleague at Genelia. So, we've been working with Mats' SIM technique for a while now, and eventually pushed beyond this 100 nanometer barrier to then get to um, 80 nanometers and with nonlinear SIM down to 60 nanometers, and still capable of looking at the dynamics of living cells. I think that, that techniques such as Palm will be good structural tools at the nanoscale, but I think this is going to be the real winner for being able to look at the dynamics of living cells beyond the diffraction limit. But it's still true that no matter what you do, no matter what method you want to use, the higher the spatial resolution you want to have, the more measurements you have to take, which takes more time and means throwing more potentially damaging light at the cell. And the moral of the story of SIM is that by backing off a bit from that limit, we can learn a lot more. So what if we back off all the way to the diffraction limit? Why would you want to do that? Well, the hallmark of life is that it's animate. And every living thing is a complex thermodynamic pocket of reduced entropy through which matter and energy is flowing continuously. So while structural imaging will always be important, a complete understanding of life requires high resolution imaging across all four dimensions of space time. And so another focus of my group is to push in that direction. And so that has led to our development based on, over the last 10 years, there's been this tremendous growth of light sheet microscopy. We've adapted this concept of non-diffracting beams, and particularly optical lattices, which was the crazy idea I was trying to work on before we dropped it for Palm, adapted that to, lattice, to light sheet microscopy, and now have a wonderful tool to look at high-speed dynamics inside of everywhere from single molecules to embryos over four orders of magnitude of space and time by this method non-invasively for very long periods of time. And so um, that got us back finally to super resolution because in the same year that we published the Palm paper, um, Robin Hochstrasser's group published a different way of doing single molecule localization, which doesn't involve photoactivation, but just the transient binding of molecules to cells. The advantage of this method is that you can have your whole bath labeled with fluorophores that just keep coming. And so you have an infinite army of molecules and can get higher and higher density. And so um, uh, 
by pushing in that direction with our lattice light sheet, which allows us to get high signal to noise single molecule imaging, even in the background of all of these molecules in the bath, we've been able to take 3D localization microscopy up about two orders of magnitude in the number of localizations you can get. As you can see, like in this example, where we're looking at a whole dividing cell about 15 microns thick, and looking at about 300 million molecules, which again is about two orders of magnitude more than a typical image. So um, the final challenge, I think, going forward is how to take cell biology away from the cover slip. Most of what we know is from immortalized cells, but that's not where cells evolve. So we need to look at them inside of the whole organism. The problem is that the light rays are scrambled as you go in, and so we're now adapting techniques first developed by astronomers to make ground-based telescopes have resolution as good or better than the Hubble Space Telescope. And so in this case, you can see moving into the zebrafish brain with this adaptive optics technique, and now we turn the adaptive optics off. That's what you would see with a normal microscope, and then going back on. That's just getting back to the diffraction limit. So the ultimate goal of my group is to try to combine these technologies to be able to look deep in a, in a multicellular context, to be able to look non-invasively and fast with methods like lattice light sheet, and then bring in super resolution techniques such as SIM and PALM to then add the high spatial resolution on top of that. At that point, I'm done and I'm out of microscopy and I'll be back into that black phase and trying to figure out something else new to do. So, um, uh, so I'd just like to end with a couple things. First, um, there's many, many people to thank, but really, let me get this thing running right, because I want to get through those pictures. So, but the, the guy I have to signal out is Harold. I mean, I would have flamed out of Bell Labs in my first few years if I hadn't latched on to him as a friend and, and a mentor. Um, and then I, there's no way I would have had the courage to pursue Palm on my own without him by my side. And so one of the bittersweet things about winning this award is, is not having him here by my side up on the stage. But I, I feel this award is, is very much as much his as it is mine. And then the last thing I would like to say is a lot of what you heard this morning, you know, like Suji's talk and Stefan's talk and, and my talk is about taking risks. And you, people are always exhorted to take risks. And that's fine, but you're, you're hearing that from guys whose risks paid off. But it's not a risk unless you fail most of the time, okay? And so what I'd really like to do is I'd like to dedicate my talk to all the unknown people out there in any walk of life who have gambled their, their fortunes, their careers, and their reputations to try to take a risk, but in the end failed. And so i just like to say that they should remember that it's the struggle itself, that it's its own reward, and the satisfaction that you knew that you gave everything you had to make the world a better place. Thank you for your time.